thanks very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the CLA and the CRO Roundtable welcoming me today to, to spend a little bit of time with you and, and talk a little bit about data and the use of data, in particular alternative data, to mitigate risk and drive growth at the same time. So I'm going to share my screen at this point in time, and I'm happy to um, take this as a conversation as opposed to, you know, a formal presentation. So, so free, feel free to, to raise your hand or, or interject it with any questions you have as we go along. So, you know, I kind of wanted just to talk a little bit about, about, you know, what is the challenges? And honestly, you know, just listening to you guys a few minutes ago, you know, it really uh, makes me feel like there's never been a more challenging time to be in risk management. You know, we have macroeconomic headwinds that we're dealing with. They're putting significant, significant stress, not only on consumers, but on businesses themselves. Um, you as lenders, as well as small businesses that are out there. You know, we're seeing today that, you know, with the announcements from all the major banks, with the loss provisions significantly increasing, projects and funding getting cut, you know, and everybody taking a more conservative view to, to you know, their business and how they're lending. You know, at the same time, we have consumers who are looking for more unsecured uh, credit. They need access to credit. So, you know, the market growth is out there. The exciting part is, you know, it's not just from people who could be getting on to the, uh, the balancing wire of, you know, are they going to tip over? Are they not going to tip over? But, you know, we have an increasing, uh, you know, immigrant population that is also helping us. But how do you navigate all of that? You know, and how do you do it in an agile way to make sure that you can respond to macroeconomic conditions, to competitive threats and to growth opportunities, you know, in an agile, quick manner and still be able to, to you know, feel free that and feel confident that you're making sure that you're not exposing yourselves to incremental risk. Uh, apologies, there we go. So you can see some of the statistics on here. Um, you know, again, I don't think any of this will be surprising to, to you on the phone. You know, combating fraud every day, I think there's a new story out there about how fraudsters are taking advantage of consumers, they're taking advantage of businesses, they're finding new and expanded and creative ways to do it. I, I don't know about you, but my spam and my email just has, is blowing up, you know, anywhere from, hey, I, I, you know, I forgot to send you these two pictures or these digital, you know, these digital photos from our trip. And, and, you know, I don't know about you, but they've sent it in a really timely manner. So things like that with a link to click that obviously will capture your data, um, you know, we know that, you know, mortgage fraud is out there. That's happening, um, you know, it, every way that we can imagine. And we are tired of talking about the pandemic. We know we're all tired of talking about the pandemic. But the reality is the pandemic changed things. Um, we talked about the fact that is the data that we've seen during the pandemic going to be relevant? Is the data before the pandemic going to be relevant? Is it a combination of the two? Or is it something completely new and nuanced that we have to think about? You know, the reality is pandemic drove digital adoption much more rapidly and opened up both opportunities and challenges to us in that. So we, you know, we have to think about, you know, how do we, you know, manage this evolving marketplace where, you know, the fraudsters are, you know, ever increasing, finding new ways to do it. Um, you know, people are looking for more credit. And at the same time, you know, we have this new population of people that we want to be able to lend to and who are desperate to get access into our services and our and, and our credit. Um so that's a lot to navigate, guys. And I don't envy you, uh, you know, with trying to navigate that and consider how you're going to do it. And at the same time, you know, we know that the need to drive revenue, to increase our profitability and, you know, to not be just blocking things, you know, is not going to go away, especially for those of you that are in public companies. You know, we have to be beholden to our shareholders and our you know, executives, our board members, everybody to drive incremental growth. So how can data help you? It can certainly improve your agility. Um, you know, we've talked about 360 degree view of clients for many years now. Uh, I think we're finally at the point where we're actually able to get this in a much more holistic way. Uh, and it can help you both from you know, an understanding of who the person is, as well as managing the risk to dealing with that person. You know, when we consider data, we think about it in three broad buckets, you know, identity, 
you know, KYC, meeting your regulatory obligations, making sure that you know who the person is, that they're not, you know, a bad person and that you should let them in the door. You know, preventing fraud. Obviously, you know, if we can close the door as tight as possible while still leaving it open for the good people, you know, that's a, you know, that's where we want to get to. And of course, assessing people's credit worthiness. Within this, you know, I think there's some pretty interesting stuff that that has emerged in the last few years. Um, you know, when you look at ID verification, you know, the ability of uh, using a software package now that had links into government agencies all around the world and is able to do so right within your onboarding process and your application process uh, to be able to take that and, you know, use um, biometrics and, you know, and looking at the ID and verifying that the person is, you know, that's applying is the person in the ID and that's in a valid ID. That's a pretty cool and interesting one. Looking at, you know, fraud prevention, looking at social data is something new. And, I, you know, I know that uh, there's been a hesitation to think about social uh, data as it relates to origination. But, you know, this is more in the, in the instance of fraud prevention. You know, if you had access to social data that said, you know, with this email and with this phone number, there's six social media accounts that are associated with that. You know, they were opened in a variety of times, you know, one year for TikTok, 10 years for, you know, Facebook for the old folks in the crowd, you know, uh, 12 for LinkedIn. You know, it, it certainly is going to lead to the uh, ability to assess that this is more likely to be the real person, not a synthetic ID, um, not somebody who, uh, you know, maybe has an account takeover uh, fraud and happening where the uh, email address doesn't match the, the account order or the you know physical address doesn't match the, the phone number and things like that. So being able to take a look at that. And then, of course, again, with this new immigrant population, you know, how do we assess credit worthiness when we don't have traditional credit bureau information? So, you know, can you be looking at open banking information, looking at their transactions, looking at their income, looking at their, their bank flows and stuff like that? So, you know, there's a lot of information out here. And, you know, the question is, so why would you do it? Because we know it's not that easy. It's just to say, yes, OK, I'm going to take some new data. You know, when we look at this, according to, you know, TransUnion's report in 2022 on alternative data, you know, you can see that, you know, people who have adopted this have seen to almost a 50% increase in offer acceptance rates. Imagine what that can do to your bottom line. You know, it leads to, you know, 64% improved risk assessment, you know, near and dear to each of your hearts. How do we make sure that we're, you know, we're lending to the right people, we're lending the right amount to the right people at the right time? And then, of course, you know, the quick thing always is how fast can you see a benefit and being able to get an ROI in under a year, of course, it's, it's a, another amazing um, opportunity to, to take advantage. So I thought I would take a minute to kind of let's make this real. So that sounds great. You know, we've talked about a lot of stuff. You know, I don't know that, uh, you know, there's anything new and novel in, in the stuff that I've shared today. But, you know, so what do you do? So let's talk about a growth opportunity first. You know, so when you look at new to Canada in 2022, we had 437 new immigrants um, join us, you know, permanent residents. Uh, in 2021, you know, between the, the new immigrant and uh, permanent residents and the new to credit uh, from the Gen Z, you know, we were at 983 new thousand new consumers. You know, that's almost a million people that we could go out and capture new business from and, and generate growth. So what kind of stuff would help you be able to do that? You know, clearly, if we had access into foreign bureaus, when we're talking about the new immigrants and the people that are coming into Canada, you know, if you had the ability to go to their home country and get, get that information on how they behaved while they lived there, that's certainly something that would be beneficial from a, you know, a credit worthiness perspective. You know, that IDV I talked about earlier, you know, really making sure that you know, we are taking that um, ID and the person and making sure that we know that they are who they say they are. You know, rental information, that's something I know you guys have been asking for. It's starting to come into bureaus, but it's not 100% there yet. Um, telco is always interesting. One of the first things that people do, obviously, in addition to getting, you know, a roof over their heads is to get a mobile phone. So looking at that and, and not just the payments in, in history, but taking a look at the device ID and really making sure that, um, you know, they are where they say they're supposed to be, that, you know, they have things like, you know, how they're behaving as they're filling out an application, 
um, is is recorded and, and scored and, and making sure that you understand that, you know, it, it looks like they're cutting and pasting. It looks like, you know, the device is, you know, lying down where it should be, you know, being held up. Um, you know, is the IP address within Canada or is it still sitting overseas someplace? You know, uh, that kind of information can be incredibly rich and detailed and, able, you know, helps you understand a, you know, is this a synthetic ID? Is this like an organized crime fraud ring that's out there, you know, in a call center someplace coming in, you know, and then the credit worthiness. Can you get access into their information and what how they've behaved? Uh, and open banking would be another one to add there. So, you know, that's it's lots of things out there that could enable you to really kind of grow into that that new uh, population. So let's talk about one that's uh, that's all I hear about pretty much every day from from people when I'm talking to them. Lenders, fintechs, telcos, you name it. Everybody's worried about synthetic fraud, you know. And you know, you see Thomas Reuters kind of estimates six to twenty billion is the cost of synthetic ID fraud. That's a huge range, and the reason it's a huge range is because we frequently we don't know about it. It goes unnoticed, and it then ends up in your bad you know your bad debt book because you didn't capture it. And, uh, you know, what we're hearing is that people are doing a little different. They're not doing the same bust out fraud that they used to, um, you know, where they come in, they, you know, scale up immediately and then, you know, just never make a payment. Instead, what we're seeing is they're starting to, you know, make payments. They buy a few things and that, and they get you to continue to increase their credit limit. And then they'll bust out on you and it costs you far more than it would if they had done it at the beginning. So, so there's a lot happening in this area. Um, and again, when we look at, so how do you detect this? How do you prevent this? You know, social is a really um, strong indicator of this. Um, email, social, you know, when was the email open? How long has it been open? How many social accounts is that email associated with? You know, here's the phone number. Um, you know, facial biometrics, age and identity verification, income and employment verification. So there's a lot more data than ever before that's available to help with both of these factors. And so, you know, it's something that I think, you know, to consider what is your use case? There's many more, this is just a couple to kind of bring home, you know, how data, different data could be used for depending on what you're looking to do. So again, if only if it was easy as that, you know, you just go out and you say, great, I'm gonna grow, I'm gonna do all this stuff and, and you know, I, I'm, it's gonna be super easy. Well, we know there's challenges. You know, the reality is we hear from, you know, in particular, more established, um, you know, longer term organizations that they they struggle because of the outdated legacy systems they have. Those of you that are fintechs and, and newer into the business, you know, you're in a much more privileged situation to be able to take advantage of what, what's available because you don't have to integrate everything back into mainframe legacy stuff. So, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges we have. You know, and so even if you're able to get it in, how are you able to integrate that data into your risk process? How can you normalize the data? How can you orchestrate the data? Um, you know, how can you bring in multiple different data sources without, you know, it becoming super arduous, both for yourself, as well as introducing too much friction into your process for your customers? Because the last thing that you want to do is make it so lengthy and so arduous um, for them to, to be able to get access to your services that they just abandon and they walk off and go work with somebody who's much easier to deal with. And then, you know, it's heavy lifting at times, again, depending on your technology. So, you know, we hear, again, many people are saying that they really lack the, the resources to be able to, to process and analyze it. They don't have all the data scientists that they need. They don't have the people who in technology or their technology, you know, stack, um, you know, takes so much time to get into a roadmap that, you know, by the time they were able to get into it, it's already too late and people have, you know, moved on and there's something fresh and new that they want to do. So obviously, you know, this is a very, very simplistic view of a data life cycle. So, you know, the first thing to, to do is really think about, you know, what is the right data, you know, and when you think about that, you really have to think about, you know, what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, what kind of um, coverage is available? You know, sometimes it's called hit rates and things like that. So, you know, when you go out to look for this data on these individuals or this group that you're trying to, the cohort you're trying to make a decision on, 
you know, does it have the right coverage and the right information there for you? You know, being able to integrate that, um, you know, and pull it into your, your decisioning is the next step and then analyzing it and iterating on it. So, you know, again, it's simplistic view. So, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know, when you think about uh, actioning the data, which is really where it becomes, you know, interesting and, and exciting because data for the sake of data doesn't do anybody any, any good, you know, and so there's new technology out there now. And when you think about it and, you know, it's the, the data strategy itself is one thing. The actioning of the data is the next thing. And so with the entrance of auto ML, you know, you're able to process much faster and more accurate models that have a wider usability within your workflows. You know, if you can imagine, you know, taking your outcome data and with a click of a button, asking your system to go out and generate new models for you. And it not only does that, but it comes back and says, okay, out of the you know 20 models I built, here's the best model for you. Here's the data attributes that are most, you know, lending into that decision. And here's the lift that you're going to get from doing that. You know, all of this is is available today. Um, and it's able to, you know, to to really significantly advance and turn your data into actionable insights. So what I'm going to, you know, just conclude with, and, you know, I don't want to take too much more time is just, you know, there's a lot of benefits to data. There's a lot of data out there. And really now it's about, you know, taking a look to say, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? What insights do I need? You know, am I trying to grow? Am I mitigating risk at the same time? Am I, you know, uh, combating fraud? you know, in understanding the fundamentals of what you're trying to accomplish, and then taking a look to see what data providers are out there, what's the best technology to support this, and, you know, and how do I bring this in and make it a reality in a timely, agile manner for my uh, organization.